30 years ago, on February the 11th, 1990, Nelson Mandela, South Africa's anti-apartheid leader and cultural icon, walked free from 27 years of imprisonment. It was perhaps the beginning of the end of apartheid in South Africa. Born on July the 18th, 1918, Mandela joined the African National Congress in 1944 and became involved in the long political struggle for the rights of black South Africans. Mandela spent 27 years in prison in his struggle against apartheid, a system based on strict residential, economic and social segregation on the basis of race. Non-whites were not allowed to vote in national elections. Under apartheid, black people were confined to squalid ghettos. In every sense, it was a political system based on denying humanity to non-white people. Mandela guided the country through a dramatic transition that marked the end of apartheid. In 1994, he became South Africa's first black president. His government focused on dismantling the legacy of apartheid by tackling institutionalized racism and fostering racial reconciliation. The globally revered leader then stepped down after serving one term as president before retiring from public life in 2004. Mandela died on December the 5th, 2013. In the words of the former US President Barack Obama, he was a symbol of justice, equality and dignity around the world. Hi, I'm Michelle Malik and you're watching Inda Special. Today marks 30 years since Nelson Mandela, South Africa's anti-apartheid leader, walked free after spending 27 years in prison. Four years after his release, Mandela became the first black president of South Africa. His legacy continues to be remembered and celebrated to this day. But what lessons, lessons were learned from the brutal apartheid in South Africa and Mandela's struggles? And where does the fight against racial segregation and discrimination stand today? Joining us for this discussion is Mr. Saeed Khan, Senior Lecturer in Near East and Asian Studies and Global Studies at Wayne State University in Detroit. He joins us from Detroit. Also joining us today is Professor Rayshawn Ray, who's a sociologist and Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institute, joining us from Washington, D.C. A very warm welcome to both of you to the show today. Mr. Khan, now, when we talk about Nelson Mandela's release from prison and the 30th anniversary that marks it today, this was not just big news, not just something that was uh, impactful for South Africa, but for the entire world. Take us through the impact of this. Well, I mean, it was the culmination of a, uh, a struggle uh, that in many ways uh, galvanized a lot of people around the world who were fighting against injustice. It also showed the divide between those who were clearly uh, looking to support the maintenance of the apartheid regime uh, for either racial reasons or for geopolitical reasons. And we see that when the Cold War ended, a lot of the geopolitical reasons uh, fell, fell apart. And so those who were still opposed to Mandela then exposed themselves for really the kind of racial bigotry and the hatred that they had. But as a result of it, a lot of the potency behind the opposition uh, to release Mandela and for maintaining apartheid, as it withered away, it gave an opportunity. And I think it's important to recognize that it took uh, a certain level of courage also for the South African regime to be aware of the changing tides around the world and the fact that its own position now had become so weakened. And so when we find uh, F.W. de Klerk uh, making uh, the gesture of not only, first of all, freeing uh, Mandela from prison, uh, but then moving toward a, uh, uh, a kind of reconciliation in the country, which culminates uh, four years later, as you said, with Mandela's uh, election and a new South Africa. Uh, this is a paradigm shift that I think should be seen in its context as a source of great inspiration uh, for people who will be able to reject the binary of uh, a system that seems to be entrenched in perpetuity. And the idea that even those things which seem to be immovable can be moved by the popular will uh, on an international level. 
Right. Uh, Mr. Khan, now, as we talk about the scent being pivotal in uh, the history, in world history in general, of course, the legacy left behind by apartheid still remains today, especially seen in South Africa's own society, but also in many other parts of the world, the precedent that was set, and also how apartheid was one of the worst manifestations of what was happening, one of the worst manifestations of racial segregation. How do you think things have changed since then? Well, well, I was in South Africa actually uh, three months ago, uh, was in Cape Town, in fact, even visited uh, uh, Mandela's prison cell in uh, in uh, Robben Island, and I was struck by seeing two different factors in uh, in South Africa. On the one hand, we clearly see this post-apartheid uh, South African society where there is the commingling of uh, the various uh, ethnic groups, and it seems, on the one hand, a kind of harmony as though it had existed there uh, for all time. But at the same time, it is tempered by the specter of apartheid. People uh, do not forget. Uh, I spoke to several people who, in fact, were not only there in the midst of apartheid, but were direct victims of a lot of the uh, the racist policies. And I think that this balancing act is a very important one when we see a country like South Africa, that there is the memory, there is not the dwelling of the memory on uh, apartheid, there is the uh, spirit of moving beyond it toward the future. Uh, but at the same time, it has set a baseline for uh, the people of South Africa to say, we will not accept anything close to this again, and also provides them with an empathy for other situations and crises around the world. So speaking to South Africans, uh, they will immediately go ahead now and speak about some of these challenges uh, facing other peoples around the world providing for them solidarity, providing for them support. And so I think we see an example then of a country that has the kind of moral compass that uh, other countries claim to have but have now ceded. Right. On that point, uh, I do want to want us to take a listen to Nelson Mandela's own words after uh, the apartheid regime ended. Whites are fellow South Africans and we want them to feel safe and that we appreciate the contribution they have made towards the development of this country. Right. Uh, Professor Ray, as you heard the words there, Nelson Mandela appreciated the white minority, the minority that held so much domination over the majority of the South African people here for their efforts, for their struggle, collected them as one. And the, these words resonate with what Mr. Khan said about being able to have that empathy, being able to move beyond just rhetoric and actually doing uh, with equality. Those examples, how much of an impact have they had on the more developed nations, the European nations, those who were colonizers? Yeah, I think Nelson Mandela's legacy, legacy clearly extends around the globe. And that clip is an example of him reaching out, giving an olive branch. And I think part of this, what we have to realize is I'm unsure if he would have made that statement 30 years prior. Um, you know, I think it's something to say about Mandela and the other people who were in prison in Robben Island. Similar to Mr. Khan, I had the, the, the privilege of visiting there uh, several years ago. And what I, what I vividly remember was not only the fact that there was so much stone on the island um, in the prison, that's part of the reason why, ne why it was difficult for Nelson Mandela to walk, his back, his hips, his knees. But the other thing was Mandela built a, uh, a garden actually in the prison. That was his own form of solitude. And what we seen was a transition of a man and the people who were working with him to build empathy. And I think what he understood was that there were some white South Africans similar to around the world, uh, dominant group members who don't necessarily believe in some of the things that's happening as it relates to apartheid, segregation, racism and the like. But they oftentimes become complicit in their actions. And part of what Mandela aimed to do was to empower them the same way that he was empowering black South Africans to actually do something about what was going on. And I think the United States is currently in this pathway now. I think what people don't realize is that reconciliation and atonement take a very, very long time. When you have an injury, oftentimes those injuries are acute, but it takes a very long time for those injuries to heal. They oftentimes have chronic manifestations. And that's what we see with apartheid and racism. Right. And I think at this point in time, when we are seeing all across the world 
racism, racism increasing, xenophobia increasing. We're seeing an assault on many minorities. I think it's worthwhile to talk about apartheid and the socialization process, if you say, that goes into that. Otherizing someone, uh, making them uh, feel like they're inferior, also making those belonging to your own class, your own race, make uh, otherize that community altogether. What's that process like? What goes into it and when does it begin? Uh, Professor Ray, we would love for you to shed some light on that. Yeah, so when it comes to the socialization process of what apartheid does, I think it's important for people to realize what apartheid is. Apartheid is essentially the legal, political, and social separation of groups, and then implementing that one group is superior to another group. Part of what that means is then the inferior group gets sent messages as well as uh, actual implementation of their lives, separation of schools, separation of neighborhoods, the dumb pass that Mandela and others actually burned was significant. That dumb pass was something that black South Africans and colored South Africans had to use as they were going from place to place. They had a curfew. Their lives were legally bound. And I think that's one of the big things people have to realize. It's not just that someone is telling you to do something. It's actually legalized and systemic. And then part of what that does is, is that there are consequences when you act outside of that. And oftentimes, physical, violent, and deathly consequences for the actions that people take. I mean, we've seen that even into the 70s and 80s. For example, there's Soweto uprisings where there were hundreds of students who were murdered by people who were supposed to be protecting them, murdered in churches. Those sort of actions actually suggest to people that I shouldn't get out of line. I mean, imprisoning Mandela and others for decades on an island away from the mainland shows people what happens when you get out of line. So it becomes part of a social psychological process where it's not only about people just trying to stay safe and alive, but it's also about the fact that then they start aiming to protect their children. And when you not only attack, the, attack adults, but you attack children, it shows people what happens. And again, we see this around the world. We see this in parts of Asia, we see this in the Americas. I mean, obviously, when we talk about lynching and, and enslavement in the United States, we see this around the world. That is, there are different forms of apartheid. Nancy Denton and uh, I mean, Massey, Denton, Massey uh, Doug Massey and Nancy Denton had a book called American Apartheid, which talked about how apartheid operated in the, in the United States versus South Africa. And I think that's a book that people should look at to really understand the social, the social psychological impacts of apartheid. Right. Uh, Professor Ray, just a, a last question. Now, when we look at our modern conditions today and we look at the world affairs around us, many political rhetorics being put out, many laws being promoted uh, by those belonging to extreme right wing groups. Do you see that we have learned the lessons from history or do you feel like we have a long way to go? Well, I think it's both. I think we have we have a long way to go and we are learning. But there are certain things that we can continue to move the needle on. One big thing that Mandela was about, he was about reconciliation. That was about thinking about the minds and hearts of people, that empathy that Olive Branch you talked about. But he was very clear about changing the economic and political systems in place. Part of what that means to be deliberate about it is a form of reparations. So in South Africa, even though some people have a lot of problem with the way that they are doing it as it relates to uh, taking land away from farmers, but when it comes to land and money, these are ways in which we think about the atonement process. The United States is currently dealing with that now, that there are bills being presented to discuss, simply to discuss reparations, to discuss enslavement, the legacy of Jim Crow, the legacy of segregation. And I do think that down the road that a reparations package will be put in place. One of my colleagues at Brookings, Andre Perry, and I are working on a package. Dr. Sandy Darity at Duke University, he is working on um, a very compelling book on reparations. And I think that it's not just about the economic and political systems and doing something about the segregation of neighborhoods. Because as Mr. Khan said, when we look at South Africa, yes, we see a lot, particularly in Cape Town and parts of Johannesburg, we see a lot of thriving. But then we also still see the legacy of shanty towns. Right. There are still people living in shacks, living in places without running water. And we still have to deal with the poverty that exists uh, after we deal with reparations and atonement.
Right. Uh, thank you so much, Professor uh, Reece, uh, Sean Ray, for joining us and talking to us about this. Later on in the show, we do want to talk about where South Africa stands today. But uh, Professor Khan, similar to the question I put to Professor uh, Ray here, when we're talking about what we're seeing unfold, and especially when we look at Asia, how we're seeing cases of ethnic cleansing unfold, how we're seeing discriminatory laws being passed, what can we see about how the tide is changing? Do you feel like this is a fresh wave of racism, of xenophobia, of an assault on religious minorities? The way to then go ahead and be successful in these kinds of policies is to instill a sense of fear. And so the fact that fear mongering has become such a profitable uh, commodity today is something that we need to go ahead and assess. In the case of South Africa, uh, it was, of course, about the economics, uh, not only instilling a fear in the black population, dehumanizing them and and uh, demoralizing them. But it was also about putting fear into the white establishment, that if they were to yield even a single inch of land or policy, that they somehow or the other were going to face an existential threat. And this is exactly the kind of way that we see xenophobia now spreading, even into what would have otherwise been seen as stable economies, stable democracies, mm -hmm. like those in the West. So it's important that as we take the legacy of Mandela and we take the legacy of South Africa in its transition from apartheid to post-apartheid, that we try to find an antidote. What Mandela was so successful in doing was not only being an inspiration to the black community of South Africa, but simultaneously going ahead and allaying the fears that the white establishment had actually put into the white population of South Africa. Right. So if we then are going to find another Mandela, it has to be somebody who, form, uh, who uh, follows that template. Right. At that point, I want to also introduce Professor Melissa Stain, who's a South African Research Chair in Critical Diversity Studies at the University of Witwatersrand. She joins us from Johannesburg. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Melissa Stain, for joining us. Now, when we talk about the legacy left behind by Nelson Mandela and how that's impacted South Africa and continues to impact South Africa today, where do you think that stands? It's immeasurable. Um, I think that uh, Nelson Mandela obviously was the person who was the face of the anti-apartheid struggle and his release um, was the moment of victory for the struggle. Um, even though, of course, 1994 was when we got our democracy, that moment when he was released psychologically was the most, most important moment for um, South Africa for indicating that that era of struggle, the era of, of um, institutionalized white racism had ended and that it would not be able to come back. Um, and, and also, you know, instilling the sense that there is a future for all South Africans, that, that um, the, this is a place in which reconciliation was going to happen. Um, th this was all part of his legacy, and as much as we obviously have our challenges, I think we still owe him and his close comrades an incredible debt. Right. Professor Melissa Stan, on that point, how many struggles still lie ahead of South Africa? Now, the World Bank states that it is the most unequal country in the world, of course, taking into the context of the enduring legacy of apartheid. Now, to this point specifically, the most unequal country in the world. What is causing for there to be such a blockade towards the road to development when you look at the political front and the social front? Yeah, well, I think there are many factors. Um, the most important one has to be that when South Africa became a democracy, it was just a time, obviously, sanctions ended. So South Africa opened up to the broader community, the global community economically. Um, and um, it was also just at the time when neoliberalism was becoming such a powerful um, economic um, system. Um, so the people who had the major control over their economy were white South Africans who very rapidly made um, full use of the new economic situations and the new opportunities that happened. And um, I don't, I don't think that we've we've had a, a, a change of heart sufficiently for white South Africa. 
governments to um, want to change the economic system and to ensure that the, the economy is fairer. So while that remains entirely as it is now, pretty well in private hands and uh, controlled predominantly by white South Africans, um, I think it's very difficult to change. So we we have found that uh, government has not been effectual in in changing those patterns of ownership of the economy, and um, there's uh, I don't think that from an economic side there's really been a great will to to change the economy to be more inclusive. Right. And when we say that the economy fails to become more inclusive, the top 1% of South Africans own almost 70.9% uh, of the country's wealth. What reforms have worked, if any, that you would say have at least tried to address this issue? Well, you know, um, we've had various policies like affirmative action, obviously, and we've had like black economic empowerment and that was changed to broad-based black economic empowerment. Um, none of these have actually seen the results that we would have hoped for. Um, and, and clearly there needs to be a stronger grip on the economy that the government has to take stronger action to to try to create um, a, you know a, a redistribution of of the economic resources in the country right mr khan this is of course unique to south africa the way democracy was established and the turbulence that surrounded it and how it continues to impact society today but is this characteristic of uh, an economy or in a country which has uh, gained freedom in many ways in this way. Well look, well, look, I mean, if we take a look at the timeline uh, now in 2020, we're ju we've just crossed uh, one generation of uh, South Africa truly being free, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, inclusive. And so there's a learning curve uh, that's going to be inherent in any society for that to happen. In the United States, with the emancipation of uh, the slave population, uh, it took several generations. And again, uh, in America, it's still a work in progress, uh, having to go through the pains of the Jim Crow laws, uh, the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964, a century after the Civil War. Now, I certainly hope that South Africa has uh, a quicker path toward the progress that it deserves uh, and that its people uh, deserve. Uh, but you're going to have to find that there is a restructuring of the infrastructure. There's going to have to be incentivization. And there's also going to have to be uh, a change in culture. Uh, the fact that there is now this freedom for so many in South Africa doesn't mean that people still don't have virtual or invisible cages and fences. The idea that they still feel as though they are encumbered from uh, having access. Uh, one small anecdote, uh, I was speaking to a family, uh, the children wanted to go to the beach. Uh, their grandmother says, go to the beach, but don't go to that particular part of the beach because she still remembered it as being a segregated part which was off limits. Even though it's been 25 years since uh, those barriers have been legally removed, culturally and psychologically, they still exist for so many people. And therefore, it's understandable that when it comes to these other aspects of society, whether it's education, whether it is occupation, that people are uh, occupations and careers, people are still going to have those perceptions. That needs to uh, have further work done to give confidence to people that they do, in fact, have the opportunities and it is, in fact, their rights to exercise it. Right, Mr. Khan, that's a, an extremely powerful point you put there. The invisible cages that still surround people, their memory, their conception of how their society is to be like. And to reimagine uh, their own culture as it was before the colonizers came or before it was tarnished in many ways. How can that process be aided by the international community? Now, there is a lot of talk about reparations, how economically, you know, uh, it can help, how say, giving a formal apology, that might help. But what can the international community do to help a community that's grieving and still has wounds to heal? Well, I think the uh, the best solution is for the international community to uh, 
uh, not forget or ignore South Africa. Uh, it is a country with tremendous potential. Uh, there is always the danger that after Mandela came through, after apartheid was lifted, that uh, some in the international community now felt, well, mission accomplished in South Africa, and now let's leave the country to their own devices. But I think it's very important to recognize, as uh, Professor Stain mentioned, that we do live within an integrated global community. And with the forces of neoliberalism, we are all interconnected. And as a result, South Africa is connected into these global economic chains. It is connected into the knowledge uh, streams. And so it's important then to find ways to connect it or to reconnect it into those areas. It is right. at the very southern tip of, uh, of the African continent. Uh, it is important for people to uh, remember it again and see what role it can play in, uh, in the new world. Right. Uh, Dr. Stein, I'd like your take on this as well. How can a country help uh, itself also heal in the process of all that has been inflicted upon it? And how and what can be done by the international community or by other key global players in helping that country? So, so I'd like to just make one particular point around the international community, um, which is that, you know, as as somewhat South Africans have, have um, felt aggrieved by the changes and the sense of loss of power, um, and they, many of, of people, you know, who'd fit that description have emigrated, we have found that there's a, a kind of a regrouping of um, a white aggrieved sentiment that links to those in South Africa who also share those sentiments. And they're given quite a lot of credibility. John Donald Trump has acknowledged them and sort of said that, you know, they, they need, need to take seriously what's happening to white South African farmers and solidarity. We've had the same sort of um, sentiment being expressed by some members of the Australian government. So I think it's very important for the international community to please understand that um, the, the real narrative that has to be written in this country is the empowerment of black South Africans and the, the um, re restitution of people's livelihoods, their dignity, the, the redistribution of the land. These are the things that need to happen and we really need the international community to support the, the, the um, efforts of our country towards that movement of, of justice. Right. On that point, thank you, Professor Melissa Stain, for taking out the time and joining us and, and Mr. Saeed Khan for coming on the show. We're going to go for a short break. When we return, we're going to continue our discussion. Stay with us. Welcome back to the show. While well, we talk about Nelson Mandela's legacy and the lessons we can learn from it today. Now, joining us for this conversation is Mr. Moin Naim, who's an analyst joining us from Istanbul. Thank you so much, Mr. Naim, for joining us and welcome to the show. Now, of course, uh, Mandela was fighting against an unjust system. He succeeded in doing so. He was the first democratically elected black president in South Africa. There is a lot to learn from what he left behind and the struggle he left behind. But also at the same time, when we look at the modern world today, many parallels are drawn, especially when we look at the case of Israel and Palestine, between what was happening in South Africa then. Do you also see that similarity? First of all, first of all we, are, we respectfully, respectfully remember Nelson Mandela, and we respectfully stand for his resistance and uh, sacrifices in order to get rid of this injustice and uh, persecution and apartheid, because he was a, a, a leader of not only of the Southern uh, African people, but also for all freedom fighters all over the world. And he was and still one of the most uh, important people who told the world, especially the, the modern world, that uh, the force and the power is not enough to control the people. Uh, what we have, if we are looking about the similarities and uh, between his fight for freedom and, and the crime what was, was uh, applied against him and his people, uh, and what's happening now in Palestine, we can easily say that uh, the Israeli occupation, the Zionist occupation, uh, uh, is, is applying now the apartheid in worst form, uh, 
than what was happening in South Africa. Uh, what Nelson Mandela and the, the South African people, South Africa people, lived in that spite, spite it was really bad and uh, hard, but really it was it, it was much better than what the Palestinian people lived today under the uh, uh, Israeli uh, occupation. For example, we have no freedom of movement, no uh, the, 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 the denial of slightest human rights is there. Uh, there's there's a theft of wealth and energy of and sources. There's no ability to reach the clean drinking water. Uh, there is no uh, uh, any price or let's say. I mean, uh, price for the human life there. We, we find the uh, killings of the Israeli occupation for the Palestinian children, youth, elder people, with no punishment, with no even uh, judgments for them. So we, we, I believe that uh, by remembering Mr. Mandela and his fight, we can at least uh, scope on the Palestinian people's fight and against the, the worst occupation than what was in the apartheid. The apartheid, the worst apartheid in the world now is, is living uh, in Palestine. But unfortunately, in, in South Africa, Nelson Mandela and uh, South uh, African right. people had the ability to get rid of this. Uh, um, Mr. Naim, stay with me on that point. I want to introduce Mr. Maker Mike, who is a lawyer and a prominent human rights advocate joining us from Australia. Thank you so much, Mr. Mike, for joining us and welcome to the show. Now, as Mr. Naim is pointing out, there is a grave similarity between the case of apartheid within South Africa and what he has witnessed and many fellow Palestinians witness in uh, the Palestinian-Israel conflict today. That's not all. We were also earlier talking about the ethnic cleansing in Myanmar, what we see of the human rights assaults of Kashmiris. Now, all of these, one wonders, have our laws been outdated? Are our laws ceasing to work? If after the apartheid, one of the most brutal forms and manifestations of racial segregation, we still continue to see this operating today. Yes, um, obviously, with the with the Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela was a was a giant of our times, and he, he, his page in history can only be compared to to the great men and women that have preceded us, um, such as Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. What Nelson Mandela did for South Africa was uh, that he mended South Africa, he brought South Africa together, despite the fact that even after his passing, um, South Africa uh, finds itself in, a, in such a tough position. It's, it's, it, it appears the world has not learned a thing from Nelson Mandela. Um, we, we've seen the suffering of the Rohingya Muslims in, uh, in Myanmar. And we, who would have thought that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi um, would have been in a position to be uh, for for a community, for a section of the population to be suffering in her hands? Somebody that was so much respected, that was revered um, across the whole world. Even Nelson Mandela himself had so much respect for what for the rights that she stood for for what she stood for in, in Myanmar and the same thing that goes the same thing goes to the Palestinians where up to, to date Palestinians continue to suffer and it's just so so many minorities across the whole world so so it appears we've not we've not learned anything from south from, from south africa and from uh, from the legacy of nelson mandela now it remains the fact that it's it's not just a question of laws people we the whole the world is full of laws and laws cannot be effective if they are not they are not respected um, human rights are not um, human rights unless the rights of minorities are respected. Um, we've, we've seen across the across the world uh, powerful and strong uh, populations are, are thriving at the expense of minorities, and it, it just it just can't be a question of laws. It becomes a question of Mr. morality. It's, right, Mr. Mike. Sorry to interject here, but before the United Nations declared the Apartheid Convention and it was adopted in 1973, there were a series of condemnations. There was a series of pressures being put on the uh, by the international community on South Africa, whether it was in the form of sanctions or travel bans. Now, all of this 
this did have implications. It did come into effect. It did have a force. It was a force in itself. When we see these modern conditions, do you feel like countries and the international community or the United Nations as a body is failing to do the same? Well, I, I, I think um, South Africa, the international, the international community did have a lot of pressure. Uh, pressure came to bear on South Africa on the apartheid regime. And, and I think we, we should put it to, uh, we forget that the pressure came to bear because there was a consensus across the whole world that what was happening in South Africa was heinous. It was uh, it was it was unacceptable, and it had to it had to end. Uh, so so generally speaking, there was consensus, and that consensus gave the United Nations the life to be able to uh, put pressure on South Africa to say South South Africa apartheid had to had to end. And this is. Uh, in the contemporary world, the uh, post um, uh, Mandela legacy, we've, we've seen that that is diminishing. The consensus that uh, the what is happening to minorities, such as in in Palestine, such as in Myanmar, uh, needs to be it needs to be it's met. diminishing. It be right, met. Uh, Mr. Mike, you make an important point there that the consensus seems to be diminishing. Mr. Moin name. Do you feel like the consensus is diminishing or it has ended completely? And without this consensus, as Mr. Mike said, it's not possible to foresee a solution or some uh, activity, at least on the international front. Do you feel like this consensus of apartheid, whether, as you state, is happening in Israel or Palestine, the ethnic cleansing in Myanmar, this has failed to actually come into being and take action? Yeah, in fact, what's happening, I mean, in Palestine, the, the condition is a little different than the, the, the what was happening. And in, in, in both in Myanmar and, and, and South Africa, that the international war or the international, what do you call it, the, 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 the new world uh, powers are responsible, are even supporting what's happening there because they are believing, uh, they, are, they are not believing in the Palestinian people's right of, of existence there. This is the main difference and main important thing regarding the Palestinian um, um, issue. Uh, there is, I, I don't believe that there is no uh, ability for the international law or international organizations to play any role in the Palestinian issue because those organizations and those um, uh, what you call international communities is not uh, uh, even fair enough to be to play a part in this uh, in the Palestinian uh, conditions or the Palestinian issues uh, solution because they are part they are part of the problem not part of the the solution itself uh, right they're a part of the problem and not the solution uh, itself mr Michael mike do we see that this could change in the near future or what kind of institution needs to come into being in order for there to be a consensus, in order for there to be some uh, what of a semblance or a struggle to address these issues? I think, it's, I think it's, it's no longer just a matter of institutions. I think we do have the institutions in place. The multilateral institu institutions are there. The bilateral institutions are there. Uh, the world is is more uh, in sync with the, with the fact that there has to be a respect for human rights. That 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 is, that is accepted. But with the the problems appears to be with the um, across the western world where where we're seeing there's a significant shift in politics uh, you, with the United Nations, uh, for instance, uh, in the United States, electing Donald Trump, uh, somebody that has very little regard for the for for international law, um, and would go to any lengths to um, to to forsake the rights of the Palestinians, the people at the at the expense of uh, being seen as a strong supporter of Israel, and uh, the the same thing with the uh, with uh, with Myanmar. Where somebody that was a staunch uh, yeah, human rights advocate in Aung San Suu has completely gone off the uh, the you know the blocks. It's no longer the the person that we used to know. So so I think uh, the, that significant shift in electing the, the 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 leadership that is being elected, powerful nations electing uh, people that if if I if I can call 
people who are not fit enough to 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 to, to stand up to or, or oppression uh, in other countries, even oppression with the, within their own countries. So I, I think as long as we see these the, these shifts in politics, which I think internationally sometimes the, there's not there's not much influence that um, the multi right. multilateral institutions will have on the United States on who they elect. So so I, I, I think as long as we continue to see. Uh, those who are at the helm of uh, politics in those powerful nations, um, I, I, I think the world needs to be prepared for. Um, right. Mr. Uh, Mike, stay with me. Um, um, I just want to get a, a last question with Mr. Moin name uh, here. Mr. Moin name now we're talking about institutional failure. We're also seeing a political tide which favors um, let's say, if not the violation of international laws, but at least disrespecting international laws. What about civil society organization, especially when we see the BDS movement? Do you feel like these organizations can bring about meaningful change? In fact, um, if we have uh, hope in the international uh, community, we, can, we don't have it on the uh, official associations, but we have still have it on the people of this of the countries of the world. I mean, the BDS movement and similar movements, I think, are the, the, the remaining hope for the Palestinians of the international community. Because those movements started uh, because they believe in the truth that the Palestinians are under occupation and the Israeli occupation are, 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 are applying an, an, a worse uh, type or form of apartheid. That's why they are moving, and they, I, I think if they still... Uh, if they continue working hard on this issue, they will be affecting, and they are now affecting the Israeli occupation um, uh, in, in the, especially in their countries, for example, in Europe, UK, and even in America itself, which, which the, the reason uh, that the, this, some of these countries started to deal with the PDS as, as an illegal movement, that this movement started to succeed in achieving some small successes in, right. in, 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 uh, in their countries. That's why I believe the BDS movement and the similar other similar movements are one of the uh, best things happen to the Palestinian uh, issue in the uh, especially European and Western countries. Right. On that point, we're going to have to wind up the show. Thank you so much, Mr. Moin Naim, for joining us from Istanbul and Maker Mike for joining us from Australia. Thank you for watching in this special. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.